Oh, here's Lewis. Hello, this is Seven Seas Cruising Association, and this is our continuating series, Offshore Communications, Offshore Apps, and HF Radio with Single Sideband. We have Trixie Morgan on SV Reverie, her husband, Evan, who's calling from Puerto Rico, and Lewis was able to come in. I was hoping Bill Woodruff could come in as well, but I'm not sure where he's at right now. But we would like to go forward and share a little bit of our information on satellite phones, satellites, locators, charts, something that Lewis has been working on we still love. Evan's even been looking at it. Now, after the event, you can go to the SSCA Cruising Association website. We do have a, um, a YouTube channel, it's free. And we have things on board like um, offshore communications that we did last week. We did provisioning and cooking offshore. We have best practices, uh, electronic charts. We have real pra uh, best practices, SSCA webinars on boat surveys and, and so on. Um, quite a few nice and free webinars. For SSCA members, they're also on ssca.org. Now, the format of this is going to be chat and Q&A, and we will have discussion slides, so we'll go through a, a piece of it. We'll have some discussion, we'll go through a piece of it, and the single sideband will start at, at the uh, after we go over some of the apps. Offshore apps and suggestions on best practices. We're gonna talk a bit about satellite, which is usually Iridium, email and connectivity. Weather applications, predict when, weather services, email, ways to get your weather. And this is for offshore. Something about satellite locators with SMS, text, and GPS. A little bit about maps, charts, and chart plotter applications. And then there's a fairly large section on single sideband radio, your SSB rig, and it's simplified. If there's time, we've got uh, other material, but I doubt we'll have time for that. And if not, we will have another seminar later this summer. But the idea is how to get your mail while cruising or communications. This is a diagram thanks to Louis Soltero who has had some wonderful uh, presentations on how to get cell service or Wi-Fi away from the internet. Um, ways you can get weather data near shore or offshore, we always have slow mode devices. There isn't broadband internet offshore. No matter if you have Iridium GOES, GLOWS, SSBs, they're slow rates and size matters. There's no internet like everyone expects there's gonna be broadband. There is no Starlink. Uh, mostly the mail is email and SMS text, the HF radio line of sight. And of course you can get NOAA voice if you're close enough. You can also get broadcasts on single sideband. Usually we download once a day, sometimes we're unable. Some people use Sirius radio, but it's not dependable for us. We all depend on good antennas, little interference with uh, uh, impacting frequencies and good operator expertise. Trixie, do you have any comments on that? You're sitting down uh, in Rico. <laughs> no, I'm... Uh... For marine use yet, but it's I, I think it's gonna come quicker than we think. At least maybe I'm just hopeful. <laughs> People are already starting to use it. Yeah, the Starlink is yeah, Lewis, you could comment on that. Lewis, are you able to talk? No. I am. I was just muted. Okay. Hello, everyone. Starlink. How soon do you think we might see that? Well, so I, I good question. I don't know. And I don't know what the coverage is going to be. I know that they've got over 2,000 satellites up there, but the entire network is supposed to be close to 40,000. So they're, um, you know, not even at 10% of their allocation yet. Um, in order to be able to get offshore, <clears throat> well, let me step back. These are all polar orbiting satellites, which are very low to the surface of the Earth. So um, in order for you to get offshore um, connectivity with Starlink, uh, cross-linking has to happen. Uh, so currently, uh, most of the Starlink um, devices do, do a basically a one bounce. In other words, 
the party that is sending and receiving on the vessel or on shore needs to be within the footprint of the satellite to a shore station that is going to relay onto the internet. So until they get cross-linking and they release cross-linking in a production mode where the satellites can communicate between each other like they do with Iridium and be able to sustain the bandwidth that people are expected, expecting to have, um, I think availability offshore and well offshore is going to be, uh, is going to be more difficult. Now, having said that, I, mean, I just read in the news that um, one of the airlines is getting ready to provide internet next year in 2023 on board uh, the aircraft using Starlink. So I think that they will get there. We're probably still a year or more out. I have heard, uh, especially from the Nordhaven group, uh, that many of them are putting Starlinks on their vessels, especially in the northern uh, latitudes and being quite successful uh, using them. And so um, I think we're moving in that direction um, but I'm, I'm thinking that we're probably still a year out before uh, the, the mobility issue is resolved uh, for, for the network. Now, having said that, I'd like to have one on my boat, but I'm telling you, I've got a 40 foot boat and I'm wondering where the heck I'm gonna fit this antenna. The antenna is big. And so uh, that's kind of a concern as well for many of us on smaller boats. But uh, anyway, so that's kind of where we stand now. So it looks looking very good. People are putting them on their boats as we speak. It's not officially supported and uh, connectivity, especially in the, in the mid latitudes, um, it can be quite difficult. In the, in the high latitudes, it's uh, much simpler. That's what I got. Okay, well, thank you for that, Lewis. Um, I use email on our boat. I use single sideband email. I use uh, ham frequencies, but I also use sail mail. And um, wind link is what you use with ham. Um, once you have the device on your boat, it's pretty much free for download. And you can always talk one to many in a conference situation with single sideband that you cannot do with other devices. But then having said that, I also have Iridium on board. And I have um, a Zolio SMS text device and tracker because I want everything I can get my hands on when I'm offshore. Trixie, what do you have? So we have a Marine SSB, a ham radio as well. Um, we actually use VARA instead of a Pactor modem, um, which is, which we use with WinLink. Um, cost wise, it was, it was much better for us to go with the VARA instead. I mean, obviously we can't do commercial email, um, like you can with sale mail, but it works really well for us and we haven't had any issues with it so far. Um, get our free gribs, you know, our GFS gribs, which is great, but Anything we need more than that, we use. Uh, we just use the SSB and we get updates from, like we'll tune into Chris Parker or something like that to get the any of the detailed information that we may need for something. And the areas you covered this year, you were down um, further south, weren't you? Uh, we were in Florida, Bahamas, and we took I-65 to Puerto Rico. Oh, okay. And we also have an Iridium Go. We just chose not to activate it uh, this last passage. Uh, but when if we feel like we're going to need some critical information uh, from Predict Win, say, uh, we'll we activate our Iridium Go as well. Yeah, the Iridium Grow, and and I'll tell you, Lewis is just amazing. Um, he's written a lot of the compression software that some of us use, many of us use. Uh, the Iridium Go, I think almost it's, it is the device used mostly by many. But then there's also uh, Predict Wind or Oceans, but those are marine vendors and they actually sell um, either the Iridium Go devices or the SIM cards in the time. Every uh, Iridium vendor has a package and each has unique SIM cards and they usually have to be activated before you start using the service. So you better do any of that planning well in advance. Yep. And I can't tell you how many people have given a last minute scream on a single sideband radio saying, please call blah, blah, blah with this and tell them to turn it on because they forgot to turn it on and they were in a hurry when they were leaving. So you do that in advance. You check all your equipment. Um, all of the phones have a monthly fee per minute, the Iridium, um, or you can get it unlimited, but you might want to be sure that you get parking or off season possible in your vendor plans. It's a lot cheaper. 
Um, straight minutes, they're expensive. And once you run out, you run out and you get a, need a new SIM card. So the idea is that maybe you get a plan and maybe have extra SIM cards. There is MRSAT, there's various packages. They're ex, it's an excellent handset, but it's also a very ex, a more expensive handset. And um, I haven't used it. I've used Iridium, Iridium Go, and I've used Iridium Glow. Um, and in, in some cases, I've used some satellite phones on both, but not anything that, that we would use uh, in a non-commercial basis. One thing is to chair, is, is look at the satellite footprint for your area that you're cruising and select your whatever you're going to be using for satellite based on that area. And the packages are changing daily. Check at the boat shows for best buys and uh, check at the best pack packages. Remember, there's no internet offshore. And they say they have the net, but it really isn't the net. Starlink's operational, but maybe like Lewis says, not yet for offshore vessels. Do you have any comments, Trixie or Evan? I'm sure Evan does. On this this part of it, not not much. Uh, we're we're old school. We still use our SSB for most everything. Um, and I'll have comments on that when we get to the SSB part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, email application when you're using Iridium. A lot of times they're just using the Iridium services that come from Iridium itself, but then the vendors have specific email addresses, compression, spam protection. Some have their own email fe features. There's Global Marine Net, and that has Xgate compression apps. Um, Oceans offers email, ribs, weather services, and they're all vendors that sell the product, the hardware, and the communications minutes, but they also sell software. Sail mail or air mail or WinLink, those are all downloadable apps that work on your for an email system, but it's for a single sideband, although you can use it online in some settings, but you have to have the correct licenses to do that. When you set up your email, you can use either Rhythm Go or single sideband radio with most of these uh, systems. Um, but a ham operator is necessary for WinLink, which is the, yes. you have an operator's license for a general license and you pass the test. And you don't cheat and you don't do commercial stuff over it, period. Okay, what do these hardware devices look like? An Iridium Go is a box and it's a communication satellite device. It should have an antenna that has clear view of the sky. You should have an external antenna and it goes to your Android or iOS systems. Again, vendor specific, specific. And again, Radium's used a lot. Um, people are more familiar with that than single sideband, but our my rigs are 20 some years old and I've never had an error. So, but again, no internet and broadband and be sure to get devices that you can park off, off season. Think of these for data download and voice communications. A reminder, slow email, email software is loaded on your device and you access during a session. Don't advertise your offshore email address. If you get flooded with spam, you'll never get your email. Uh, the process that I follow, and Trixie, you can tell me if I'm correct on this. First, I set up my SSB or satellite and link my frequency or my numbers. I check the connections and make sure it's all clear. I turn on the email, make a connection with the email, pull it down. If I need to request for weather or text reports or anything like that, or anything that I need, I usually set that up in advance and I send a bulk load up and then I download it when it's ready, sometimes not at the same session, and I disconnect. I usually do this twice a day. And if I'm doing check-ins with nets and stuff, I always do it on time because it makes those people very worried. If you tell someone you're checking in email or voice and you don't, you're in trouble. Trixie, what do you think? Uh, I agree with that last part, 100%. <laughs> if you tell them you're checking in and you don't, it's, mm -hmm. yep, that's happened to us. Um, we do we do everything the same way you do. Um, and when it comes to doing the nets, the SSB nets are probably the best thing for us. We do at least four to five times a day. We check in with Chris Parker in the morning. We check in with the SSCA net at 8 a.m. 
We're then again with at the dude on at five o'clock. We go to Chris Parker again at six, unless it's Sunday. Obviously, there's no Chris Parker on Sunday. And then we have um, our own group of buddy boats that anytime any of us are offshore, we get on the SSB at 8.30 p.m. at a, at a set uh, channel and do check-ins again. And if we can't, for whatever reason, get on that 8.30 net and we don't have, and we're not close enough to shore where we still have cell service, then we will make sure that we at least get an email out so that they know that we're okay and where we are. Yeah, and practice before you leave shore. Yes. If new to you, because it's something you do ahead of time, not not when you're offshore, you're tired, you're getting slopped around in seaways and you can't figure out what anything works along with your body. <laughs> <laughs> weather apps. Okay. So what do you use for weather apps, Fritzy? We use Chris Parker and we and we do our GFS grips. For offshore, that's what yeah. we use. If we are if we're closer to inshore, we also check windy and um, what's the other Predict one we wind. do, Evan? Predict wind. Predict. Thank you. Yeah, when I'm offshore, I'm pulling from. I'm doing um, when I'm near shore. I do all my planning. I pull my stuff down ahead of time, and I go to NOAA and pull my. I do FTP setups, uh, FTP mail, which is a way of getting your weather from NOAA just by email. Um, but I also use Predict Wind, and I use their models. That's helpful. I have Chris Parker. Um, talk to him every morning and every evening, and um, keep charts and everything by the nav station. And talk, have a meeting if we're on passage with the crew at least once a day if weather is happening or we have something going on, so that everybody knows what's going on weatherwise. And I have a backup person for me. Um, cause I have, a, I have a habit of having accidents, <laughs> not on purpose, just clumsy. Anyway, there is a learning curve. You need to understand your boat and you need to understand your route. And there's something called polars. And I may turn that over to Lewis in a second, but, um, none of this stuff just is intuitive. You have to know a bit about weather. You have to know about your boat. You have to know how you want to sail your boat and where you want to go. So the apps that I suggest, and you can get them and try them for free. Uh, I would suggest predict wind. You can play with that at shore. You can play with windy. You can, um, there's plenty of, there's open CPM where you can play with routing. That's another software piece I'll talk about. But get it ahead of time, play with it. For goodness sakes, don't go to the boat show in October, pick up a whole bunch of toys, put them on the boat and expect to use them by one November. That's probably a very difficult thing to do. Okay, Iridium, um, I'm showing some pictures over to the side. This is a predict wind tracking map from, a, from their model, which overlays tracks. That's one rally. And they're using, they use predict wind. It uses iOS or an Android system. It has several weather models. These are weather models. They're adding more functionality. They have an internal chat feature and they just added a new data hub which has a AIS collator and MEMA pieces in the hub. Um, all of these communicate with small text via satellite. Predict Wind uses an inReach and is able to get small text messages that way. Um, further down uh, is the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, the ARC. They come from Europe. They use something called Yellow Book for tracking. They use WRI for their weather that they send out as email daily. I believe they may have some uh, contact voice as well. Um, but most vessels get rib files, depending on models, via email or radio. Okay, so some of the apps or some of the government free data or whatever. You can get NOAA weather reports. You can get text out of what's called FTP mail. Go to NOAA's marine weather site and they will have a free video showing you how much fun it is to have free FTP email when you're sailing. The thing is you have to know the file names, how to interpret and how to ask for the file names that are like PGW64A7WG and do a little code to open it in an email. 
So there's some learning curves there. Your weather, your weather files, your crib, your weather files, sail docks, all of those are generated as wrappers around NOAA data usually. Vendors with data services, weather services and tracking, that's predict when. Oceans has an email package with um, weather systems and data. They are somewhat competing, um, but both use the same back, backbone of equipment pretty much. Sail mail is a, a single sideband or it can be um, from the internet. And it's called, they use an application called AirMail or it uses an application from WinLink. Mm -hmm. The satellite trackers, and, and climb in here, guys, if I'm doing this wrong. Satellite locators and trackers, the InReach uses Iridium and the new Zolio uses Iridium. Zolio is a nice one. I just got one and I'm playing with it. Um, does text, it uses your smartphone to communicate to the Zolio. So you're, it looks like you're getting, and you get your email that way, 160 characters. So it's a nice backup. It has an Iridium satellite link. And it's about, it's reasonable. It's 200 for that unit. Same as about the inReach. They're about the same price. And probably around the same price for their um, services. Um, so Leo does have a nice parking package, five bucks a month. InReach has a nice package and it's integrated with PredictWin. So if you're going to be using some of these things, figure out which works with what. Marine Weather Center. Um, that's Chris Parker. He does email weather. He does voice weather. He does single sideband weather for broadcast twice a day and provides person in the loop. But again, PredictWin and Oceans offer these different packages. Um, Louis, did you want to talk something? Was there... Did I kind of explain that correctly? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the big difference between predict wind and oceans is that oceans is a weather aggregator. So yeah. they, uh, they collect weather from other sources. Uh, predict wind does that as well, but predict wind runs their own model. So they've got people on board that actually um, customize the weather models and tune them for the specific application. And they also buy weather from sources that are not available uh, to, come to small companies like Oceans. And so um, Spire, for example, is one of the providers that they use in order to, um, to, to deliver the weather models. And so is the European weather model, which is quite expensive to purchase and to disseminate. So um, yeah, so it's worth spending some time looking at what the offerings are for the different providers. Uh, PredictWind does not offer, for example, an email, email service. Um, um, that uh, at, that OSHA says, particularly depends on the reading mail and web. Um, but um, they do have uh, quite extensive support for apps on iOS, Android, and Mac and Windows as well. So uh, it's, it's worth experimenting or you know downloading, experimenting, and then seeing which provider works best for you. Um, but again, I think that the uh, that the weather that is provided by Predict Wind is probably more more varied and. Uh, and more widely, uh, just, you know, can cover wider ground and more different scenarios than the ones that Ocean Science did. Um, yeah. Anyway, so those are, that's my two cents worth. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, Predict Wind is located in Australia, so they have had a real focus on the um, a lot of different weather areas and um, oceans in Seattle. Um, but again, they offer an email package that Predict Wind does not. So you kind of look at who's got what but you can still get predict wind on somebody else's Iridium and communications package. You don't just have to get it from them. So figure out what's the best package for you and then figure the app that you want to lay on top of it. Right. I believe that you can buy Iridium goes and airtime from both companies, which is probably the preferred uh, delivery method for offshore uh, for both of those, those companies. Yeah. They all offer packages. And depending on SSCA has some discounts, uh, I think 20% 20, 20 for predict wind, but it's just for the uh, weather package. It's not for the hardware. Um, let's talk a bit about weather trackers, locators um, as a backup device. Although some people just use a tracker, that's what they've got. They head across to Antigua with one little device. Uh, that would not be my choice, but these are, also offer internet tracking displays like Oceans or like PredictWin, and they provide um, 
an SOS function, which I'll cover really quickly. Trixie, do you use any of these? Do you use um, uh, Enrage or Spot or anything like that? We don't. We okay. don't. It's something that we've looked into, um, but so far we just, we haven't pulled the trigger on them yet. I mean, I we do have EPIRB and, you know, MPOB, right, right, but, right. you know, it's not, not quite the same. What I ended up doing with my Zolio is I stick it in our, our dinghy because it can communicate. And I send it with my captain into say customs. So he can email me from customs. I can get the email on the boat with the Iridium Go. And it's like, uh, he can tell me what's going on, even if the DHF radio doesn't reach. So I send it like a, a mobile hotspot phone. Hotspot, exactly. Yeah. I'm a big chicken when it comes to all this. Okay, let's talk these locators. Um, Garmin inReach, there's Zolio, and they all run on an Iridium satellite backbone. Garmin inReach works with PredictWind, so it can send a text and get text messages back and forth. If you have, if your other communications device, single, single sideband or um, Iridium Go or something is down, one of these two devices would work. But you have to set it up ahead of time on their website, update your settings, email delivery addresses, test, and you use it before you leave shore. Um, Again, if you send a location message or check-in or something message, do it. Or people will think you just sank. Many of these work worldwide, but again, check the footprint. The SOS feature on these satellite devices is different than what you have on your EPIRB or VHF radio or DSC or anything like that. The um, SOS feature is a commercial service. Now, Zolio and Enreach use Geos, who works with the uh, Search and Rescue SAR uh, EPIRB response teams in the different countries. And they have about 40 different uh, languages they speak. So if you get into trouble and you push the SOS button, they will help find you. Um, remember, it's commercial, though. You're paying for those services. It's not that expensive. It's um, I think it's like uh, 20, 20, 50, $50 a person or something on your device. It depends on the plan you have, but that's what that SOS button is. It doesn't, it's not an EPIRB and these devices are not EPIRBs. They are just trackers and locators. Yeah. But they are there of use. Yeah. I'll also mention that the ACR has one called the Bibby Stick. That is oh, yeah, awesome. the Bibby Stick too. Yeah, that's a good one. That's also $200. I mean, they're pretty much all the same. Kind yeah. Of offer the same functionality. Yeah. And these are very different than the, the crew saver devices that you have on, uh, that they're selling for some of the boats. I think that's very nice to have a crew saver, but frankly, you should always be clipped on offshore. And we have two people in the cockpit and I'd rather be super proactive and not have somebody out on the deck by themselves. But, you know, we always have our little EPIRB on our, life jackets and offshore life jackets and stuff, but this is not the same as a crew saver. I'll, I'll uh, mention that the, uh, the, the Bivy, I, I think the thing, one of the things that I like about the Bivy is that the airtime plans are like super flexible. Uh, you can turn them on month to month and they're not very expensive. So oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so if, you get, if you're in, in reach, for example, you're in for a year. I know. Uh, if you do a Bivy stick, I'm looking at the pricing here. It's $18 a month, month to month. Uh, and that gives you basically, you know, 20 text messages, but you're basically using it for emergency services anyway. So you just want to turn it on, use it for your passage, and then just turn it off and not worry about it until you do right. your next passage. So they've got different plans um, and uh, you can do yearly plans or monthly plans. But I really like the fact that you can just turn it on and turn it off at will for very little money. I guess I'll have to get one of those to test. I've got two spots, which I don't. I do not um, appreciate their SOS button and they use a global star backbone. And I don't appreciate that because it hasn't worked for me in some of the places I've been. I've right. got a folio tried. I've tried the um, inReach, use the inReach and I've used the um, Iridium, various Iridium devices. Right, right. So I don't, the, yeah, the, the, the spots, I mean, the issue I have with the spot is that, I mean, you it's a one-way thing. So right. you, you can't know that, that the person that you send the message to receive the message and that, yes, they're going to take action on your behalf. 
you, can, you also can't have a communication. So you can't say, hey, you know, I broke my leg and I need some advice on how to fix that or whatever. So, so the Iridium devices, I think, are probably better suited for our needs. And, um, and, and these, uh, these little devices are quite inexpensive. So satellite phone is nice to have because you can speak to someone if you have an emergency, but uh, texting someone is not bad. And for the difference in price, um, I mean, I, I would for sure recommend one of these devices just because they're so inexpensive. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm going to have to get one of those and play with them. Um, but I mentioned the uh, SOS button. Really important who, when you push that SS, SOS button, that you know who it's going to. But you also need to tell them something about yourself. And so if you have someone who asks about you before you set up your, SF, your SOS call, that's very good because otherwise, if you get an SS, SOS call from somebody, how in the world are they going to find you or know who you are if you don't have your paperwork? So Geo's compliments, I think they work with a bitty stick too, don't they, Lewis? Well, I can find that out. But yeah, sorry about that. I was uh, I was muted. Um, you know, I'm not certain. I know I do know that there's an emergency button, and if that that product belongs to ACR. And so ACR, as you know, is the EPIRB company. And so um, I'm sure that uh, they're tied into basically the uh, emergency networks. And if you push that button, you'll you'll get help. And I just got a note from Lee Duvall. Hi, Lee. Um, he said, I've used Enrage for four years. I turn it off and on easily by the month, easily send 40 character messages off shore. Yeah, it's a nice device. So they all are. They're, I think all, um, I think are, you know, in an equal area. Here. Final comments. Um, your GPS tracking devices are registered with commercial vendors for yearly service. You have to register your SOS features. Um, GEOS goes the same government contacts as EPER, but it is not an EPER, which someone tried to tell me and I kind of had a meltdown. Um, there are some preset messages or text used, but it's 160 characters. Now, Chris Parker will send a message to either Zolio or to Enriches, 160 characters. How he does that, but he will get you, he will get messages, he will find you. Batteries are critical for transmission. If your device takes batteries, you better have a lot of them. Wrap them in plastic and keep some in your go bag. And think about that because if you run out of battery on any of those devices, they're not gonna work. Electricity is required. And have a good view of the sky. Each satellite service has a different view. Um, and from Lee Duvall, again, he says the NRH SAR service that he uses is a separate charge about $40 a year. It's, yeah, 40 or 50, but um, they use the GEOS. Okay, so let's talk map charts. I flipped too fast through there. Maps, charts, and chart plotters. Okay, so you are near shore. Offshore, it's not that big a deal, as long as there's not a rock in front. But <laughs> someone's laughing. But nautical maps are kind of important. And there's been some changes in the US about printed maps. And they're now printing from electronic nautical charts, which are called ENCs. Um, print on demand, they're still working on because they've modified things, there's things being changed. So all of the map vendors are having to come up with new formats for their charts. And it's showing up in some places. Um, Waterway Guide just came out with a Bahamas 2022, and he now uses the ENCs using um, a software product from a map tool from Aqua Maps. But the older maps are being discontinued in the USA. The rest of the countries, Europe and other places, are kind of watching to see what the USA does. But just be aware, everything that you have on your boat, if it's a map, needs to be updated if you're gonna be near shore. If you're offshore, it's no big deal. I'm sure that in 1898, there was a big rock in the middle of um, the Mona Passage and it's still there, or island. Um, it hasn't moved, but near shore shoaling areas change. So you need to update your chips on your chart plotters, your maps, if you can, and you look up the NOAA free chart maps, go online, look them up, figure out how to download maps because they now let you make a little map 
and it's a PDF, but it is a whole course to learn how to do it. You also have to use what's called an ENC viewer, and they provide a free one to view these maps online, but that's the internet, unless you download the PDF. There's also OpenCPN, open source, lots of features. We'll do a lot of importing of this stuff so you can look at it at shore or offshore. One product called Aquamaps, it makes a smart truck plotter out of your cell phone. It's iOS or Android. He has maps, much like predicting goes all over the place, so do the Aquamap folks. They're located in um, Italy, and there's an initial, the app is free, but you can upgrade it to a master, and there's a discounted SSCA. Um, but these maps, they are electronic, and they update once a month or more. So all of the data that he's downloading from the U.S. and from the other places is the most recent that he can find, and he's finding all kinds of stuff. He even has the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers shoal data that nobody else here has. But key to all data, you have to have the most recent and updated information for your plotters. Chips cost dollars. So if you have um, electronic ways to update, that's a good thing to do. Any comments, tricks? No, make sure you have your charts updated for sure. Um, we've run into issues with that before. And then come realizing we need to get our stuff updated and then you're in the Bahamas or something where you're having to like pour through all of your data in order to get your updates. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that you really need to be careful with. Yeah, and the other thing is that if in doubt, go out and look outside. If you're moving around and you don't know where you are, sometimes <laughs> looking can be a big help, especially in the shallows. Um, again, Charity. One thing I'll add. Make sure, you know, redundancy, 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 right? Um, <clears throat> we have, we, we have a Ray Marine chart plotter with Navionics maps on it for the area we're in. Right. Uh, we have a tablet with Navionics uh, voting app with the charts for the area we're in. We have, we run OpenCPN on a Surface Pro at our nav station. Uh, and worse comes worse, we also have the voting app on the phone. Uh, so redundancy is a good thing and not just in the charts, but since we're talking about charts, you need GPS, uh, backup GPS is extremely important. And we found that out, we were, I don't know, <laughs> maybe 25 to 50 miles offshore off the Abacos coming, uh, headed out to I-65 and um, we lost GPS, it was gone. Uh, poof. So I was down below with our backups, you know, it was not, not a big deal, but the Raymarine just wouldn't acquire. And then about 20 miles later, the Raymarine, Raymarine acquired the, the satellites again, it was never a problem. So you, you just need to make sure you've got redundancy uh, with both your charts and your GPS. You know, that brings up something really good, and it's not part of the apps, although it might be, is logging, logging your location every hour and the sea state and situation and the date time and where you're at and what's going on and just keeping a log. Because if electricity goes away, not that we would have that ever happen with a solar flare or something, but for someone turning off GPS or being nasty, at least that way you could dead reckon where you were at and figure out where you were. Because if you don't chart it and electricity goes away, you aren't going to know where you're at. And not many of us know how to use uh, <laughs> those little plastic sections <laughs> and have all the tables and do <laughs> sites. I have one. I've never gotten it to work. So, Same. yeah, <laughs> well, I have the books. I have it. I mean, if something goes bad, I'll learn how to do it on the fly. Right. Right. Yeah. So open CPN, open source navigation software. It's got a whole bunch of tools. It's got so much stuff and it's free. Um, you should donate to them though. Um, very nice group of mariners have put this together. You know, wonderful tools. The smart plotter for that I was talking about, this is Global Aquamaps. Um, they have a really nice deal. It's about, for SSEA members, it's under $60 for US and Canada maps forever and all the downloads. The Aquamaps Master with the ACES data for five devices and GPS, I think that's for two years. So that's, I mean, that's for five devices, you're paying 10 bucks a device. And I just back up everything I've got anywhere I've got. 
because you drop it in the water, it's gone. Water comes in the cockpit, it's gone, or could be. We have Raymarine too, and I use, sounds like we're doing a lot of the same things, guys. Any questions? Do we have any questions here from chat? I can't find, you know, this is a new version <laughs> of Zoom. And for some reason, it doesn't like my mouse. Anyway, I'm going to go to the next slides because here we're going to single sideband radio. So for those of you who aren't interested in single sideband, you're more than welcome to listen to this. Um, SSCA has experts. You're looking at two of them, Trixie. Wave your hand so they recognize who you are. <laughs> she's a mentor, and so's uh, Evan. And well, Lewis is too, but he's not a he, he's not a mentor for SSCA and in the database, but he's a mentor. Um, single sideband radio, high frequency radio. So, kind of an overview of what you've got. You got an antenna. It's a backstayer whip which is a Shakespeare. It's a big, white, long whip thing. Usually uh, multi-hulls will have Shakespeare and mono-hulls will have something of the backstay with those big insulators. And you can have a clip-on antenna. They have sell a black one that people use. Um, they work. I just think it's something you put up and try a lot first and see how far it works and how much uh, noise is entered into it. You have an antenna tuner. You have cables that go to the radio, and the radio has a microphone and speaker. Those connections and cables, GTO 15 shielded for your antenna lead, your ground and your counterpoise, those are the areas with the most problems. Those get corroded, older. Um, you need to keep them clean. You need to keep working on them. And for those of you who have new to you radios, which is some of you, I believe, um, this is where you're going to have more of a problem. Radios don't. I've had radios, two radio sets for 25 years and I've just about drowned them and nothing happened to radios. But the ground, which is the counterpoise, the copper mm -hmm. and other stuff. And Trixie, what have you experienced with your boat? So we have the, we have the backstay antenna and the tuner. Um, obviously we have a radio with a microphone. Our counterpoise was also an issue. The original setup was the big copper sheet that ran down in the in the bilge and, and in the lazarettes and it over time it just becomes completely mangled and it gets corroded and everything else and we ended up replacing ours um with uh, it was a uh, copper wiring inside um what do we put it in so it so I'm a, I'm a heretic um it it is simply half inch braided uh copper wire um, that is slid inside 25 feet of uh, half inch irrigation tubing. Irrigation tubing, that's off, what I couldn't remember. Peel off one end, connect a, connect a, a lead to the other end, uh, solder a lead to the other end, that goes to your tuner, and you just shove that tubing down into your bilge, anywhere it'll go, just wind it around. Um, and like I said, I'm a heretic, but it works incredibly well. Anybody that's seen um, the KISS counterpoise that's on the market, it's the same type of idea, but the KISS obviously has different uh, lengths of copper within the tubing cut to resonant frequencies. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't work. It, a lot of people are really happy with it. I didn't want to, I'm, I'm cheap, I'm a sailor, and I didn't want to come off the money. And uh based on my experience 40 years as a ham radio operator and 10 years as a radio repairman in the air force um you know i just keep things simple and i noodle it out and that's what we did and it worked great uh we've never had a problem with with our signal uh, but like was said you gotta keep on it you gotta check for corrosion you gotta check for your connections um and just make sure that that everything's uh well and good uh, like you, we our first radio that was on the boat when we bought her uh, still works. It's uh, probably a 30-year-old radio, 35-year-old radio. Uh, still works. We chose not to go with it. 
Um, we, I won't, I won't tell you what we do. Um, the, the thing I wanted to, to add right at the beginning is if you're still hanging on here uh, and you have an SSB and you're not sure if you want to use it, stick around for a little bit because yes, you there's, do. A, there's a compelling case for it. Uh, how long is my braided copper counterpoise? It is 25 feet. So it's, it's um, tinned copper, like marine copper, but it's half inch flat braid. And then that is shoved inside uh, half, uh, you know, half inch flexible irrigation tube, like you would use for your sprinkler system in your yard. Uh, simple as that. Uh, just make sure that both ends are sealed and you won't have a problem with it. Now I use a kiss. Um, I have had a, I have a, um, for counterpoise, I have a backstay. Um, we have a, um, where does it go up? Um, it goes up my, my mast six, up to six, I have a 65 foot mast. So it's big backstay antenna. And then it comes into the um, body of the boat and then goes to the tuner. And then the tuner cables run to my radio. Where I've had problems is in the counterpoise, the copper. That's why we got a kiss. Um, and the other place that we had problems, and even you can talk about this, um, the ground. People don't understand what ground means. And the diagrams they have for ICOM drive me nuts because it shows connecting, making a double loop of the ground because your case should not be grounded to ship's ground. You get your ground through DC. Right. And you're going right. to put your ground loop in and then you're going to have all kinds of chatter. And then when you turn things on, other things turn on. Like I had a boat this fall. Um, I helped 25, no, 35 boats this fall. So they all left for the Caribbean. 35 had all kinds of problems, some pretty easy, and some like the one when he turned on, tuned his radio, his bow thruster went on. Now that's not bad offshore, but if you're at the dock, that's not a, not very good. And who had ever uh, installed his bow thruster had just attached it to ship's ground right with the radio. So that got fixed. The other ground was a steel boat. Steel boat did not have isolators for any of his electric currents, especially for the electricity, the battery for his radio. So he emails me and asks, how come he's getting bubbles around the connection point in the steel hull where the radio connection ground is? And I, <laughs> I called the rally organizers and told them to get an electrician to that boat like immediately. They put, I think, eight isolators or whatever those things are called on that boat. And the guy left the next day, he got on and left. And I said, well, what about checking the hull? Oh, no, my hull must be fine. And off he went. I haven't heard. I'm sure he's fine. Um, but I'm using Zoom now. I go, someone has a boat issue with the radio. We Zoom in. We look at what's going on. We can help train. We give them frequencies get them started, get them on the net. And then I turn them over to people like you guys that are really on the nets to help. Because I'm sure you're on some of the net controls, aren't you, Trixie? I think she's muted. Yes, we are. So uh, we participate in the SSCA net every morning, yeah. do .net in the evening, um, and we're, we're there every day. Um, let, let me say one more thing about counterpoise. Uh, whatever you use as a counterpoise, that is that is the key to you being able to transmit. You can receive all day long without a, without a functional counterpoise. Uh, the radio does not require that to to receive. What the what the radio does require is a ground, right? And since we're in a boat, we don't have earth ground, so the counterpoise is a fake earth ground. Um, so if you, if the counterpoise, whatever you use, if that is not connected or it is corroded or it's non-existent, you're not going to transmit. Uh, all your power is going to be reflected back to the radio, and then that radio is not going to last 25 years. So really, you know, check for corrosion and check to make sure your counterpoint is working. Again, before you leave, make sure you can transmit. Uh, get, get away from the marina. 
uh, get out in the river or, or wherever uh, wherever you are away from a, a lot of electrical noise and participate in a net just to make sure that you're able to transmit. Yeah, a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these boaters now are getting new to them rigs. One thing to remind everyone is you need to have your for your new boat, get the previous owner to transfer your MMSI number to your boat and be sure you have an operator's license for your boat. That's an FCC license. So you can legally use the radio, even if you are a ham radio operator. You do not have to be a ham to be on these nets. There are some nets you can be on and there's a lot of them and you can get a lot of weather and it's all, and it's free, it's just coming to you. But you do need to have that license to be legal the MMSI number is put in the 802s um, now, and it goes to, it can be set up with a DSC, which is an emergency alarm system. Now, what you're seeing on the screen now, the radio, and that's the head. There's also a black box that's called, that's the case, but this is the, the pod with the controls on it, and then the box is separate. That's this particular type of radio that most people have now. Lower down, you see an AT140, and that's an antenna tuner. Now, what I'm going to say about this, if you have a new to you radio and you turn it on and it lights up and it has stuff on it, first of all, get the manual for your radio, and you can download it. Go to Dockside Radio. There's plenty of manuals to download. Um, get the frequencies, and then go listen to a frequency at the time that they're transmitting to see if you can hear something. That's the first thing. Learn what the knobs do and everything else. But one of the big deals on a new to you radio is to make sure that it's okay. So what you do is you go to the first channel and everyone will have, could have a different channel because everybody plays with them. You can get that commercially reset, but I usually go and pick six frequencies and set them in the radio and I don't worry about the other 450 of them. But I always hit, go to a frequency, hit the tune button and listen for that tuner to click. If I can't have the tuner click or someone out listening out where the tuner is and hear it click when I'm tuning, there's something wrong. And it could be the tuner. It could be that if you're not transmitting, it's the counterpoise. Either way, something's going on that you need to work out. Um, your GTO cable, your beautiful white cable, be sure you put it up and have it up correctly. And at the very top of the antenna, make it kind of a J loop. And then make sure it is steel to steel and fasten to that backstay if that's what you're using and clean. Do not, please do not put on grease on both sides so you keep it from rusting because that's going to make it so it doesn't work. Also, you do not want to have electrical wire around your backstay and then put your wire to the electrical wire and then fasten it because that's going to be a problem too. And the reason I mentioned this is because I've done that. I've had all those issues where something looked beautiful, but you have to peel it about part and look. So those antenna connections are really important. And for goodness sakes, get a new GTO 15 feet line. Uh, water wicks down that, you can have really scratchy sounds and you don't know why. Um, you're gonna have standoff insulators possibly, um, backstay insulators. You're gonna have heavy gauge wire. You're gonna have ground straps, plates. You may have alternative antennas alternative grounds, but don't use two at once. And you could have a Pactor modem or what you have, Trixie, which is the Avia, right? I don't know if she can hear me. It's Vara. Uh, Vara, V-A-R-A-H-F, uh, -A -A um, runs at about close to Pactor speed, Pactor 4 speeds. Um, the only problem is SailMail does not support Vara. Uh, oh, okay. Which, which does, but SailMail doesn't. Um, so if you're an amateur radio operator and you are using WinLink, you can use Vara. Vara is seventy dollars for a lifetime license. It's all it's all software based, uh, as opposed to a Pactor, which is about eighteen nineteen hundred dollars. So, well, again, I have a, a Pactor, but you know, it'd be interesting enough to get that. And I've even tried a Raspberry, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> 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 okay, here's what your radio looks like when you're there's a backstay antenna at the top. You can see the insulators with the GTO 15. See on the on the um, left side, and it comes down, it goes to your AT140. You should probably have standoffs. Um, 
if you have really good insulated wire, I've never had a problem with that. But um, if it's possible to put a stand up there, if nothing else, it keeps that wire from being damaged from heat from your stainless rigging in the hot sun. Um, they show a counterpoise here that the very bottom, the two inch copper metal strap goes along the bottom. And then you may have a ground plate or something. And they show a whole bunch of other stuff here. But again, you don't fasten your, case, your um, 802 radio or any radio case to ship's ground. You've got that through the ship's battery. So just be aware of that. This diagram isn't, isn't the world's best. But then also note on the radio, it has a GPS so that you could send out a GPS message. And again, it shows different things, twin lead radials, and it's got RG, 8X cables going to the tuner and all that kind of stuff. But um, a good, this would be a good installation, except for the one ground I don't like. Any comments here? Evan? No, not really. Um, Standard picture. Yeah, the, so Harry uh, mentioned the M803. Yeah, uh, M803, yeah, that's true. You know, hopefully people aren't going out and necessarily buying brand new ones. Uh, but they're they're great rigs. They they're solid. Icon makes makes great stuff. Um, so whatever, whatever icon you pick up, you can pick up a well, I think the old, old one seven ten um, or something like that. So it, it doesn't matter if your boat came with um, an old icon or an old SEA. They all work. They're still single sideband radios, and and they'll work for you if you've got it per if you've got everything connected correctly, like this diagram shows. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing that's happened to me is someone comes with a radio they don't know how to work, and it's something that was made like forty five years ago, and there's no manual, and he's never used it, and I've never used it, you know, and it's just you kind of trace things down and try to do, hey, stupid, and see if you can get it to work at all. But it's work sometimes. Again, uh, connections and cables, that's the area of most problems. Check and reconnect annually for rust and water ingress. Um, really check that antenna, the backstay attachment, clean the stainless to stainless. Don't use grease electric tape for sprays between attachment points. You have never died and lived until you've watched somebody have to go up in a uh, bosun's chair to try to scrub off the grease and everything else they put up on their backstay to attach, which they thought was smart. Um, all antenna connections, all, all boat connections, exposed envir environment, which means the air, have corrosion issues. It just happens. Um, copper foil or ladder of copper or laid down copper in the hole, that's what you were talking about. Uh, different than ship's ground. And be sure you don't have ground loops um, because it causes issues. And for goodness sakes, if you turn on your radio and transmit, all the lights turn on in your boat and your air conditioning turns on, trace down where its wires are crossing or interference is happening because it's not necessarily good for your boat or you to have things turn on suddenly. And Brooke has to scoot. We'll catch you via the YouTube stream. And Trixie says, thank you for watching. That was nice, Trixie. We're almost done anyway. And let's see here. Here's the kiss. We kind of covered that. Multiple wires, probably no better than a single 10 foot wire. I didn't say that, did I? And it usually works. Before you leave, check your cables. If you have bundled cables, cables on cable room, do not put your high power cable and tape them neatly up with your radio cables. That has caused more problems. Um, check and re-secure your external connectors. Get a new frequency list, just like maps. They change. I use Dockside Radio. He's got some good lists and he's got some good electricians there for radio support. Pre-program your rally and emergency frequencies. Create a cheat sheet near the radio with schedules and frequencies and review the protocol with your crew. Something may happen to you. Have everyone know what to do. Consider noise canceling headsets. And check in with a radio net. 
Like I said, SSCA has KPQ radio, and you should also have a float plan, boat information posted near any of your communications. All those things like MMSI number and your engine number, your names, your passport, whatever it takes for a float plan, you should have that printed. Each of your crew should have it, but have it posted near your radio. So in an emergency, you don't have to go, where's my MMSI number when someone's going, do you have your life jacket on? And you're going, well, but the water's up to my knees. Um, If that doesn't usually happen, I doubt it, but it's better to have emergency information right in front of you, especially for radios. Um, Trixie or Evan, do you have any comments on this? Uh, we, we simply just, cause things change. Frequencies change. Yep. Um, times change. We just, uh, we have a label maker and we print out what we need on, on a label and we stick it to the front of the nav station. So our, our nav station sits right below our electric panel. We have spare room on the, you know, on the big panel above the, the nav station, we just stick stickers on and we can peel them back off and we can put them back on. That way I don't have to worry about uh, keeping a file, updating the file, uh, printing it out, whatever. So all of that information that you said, the MS, our MMSI number, our, whole, our, uh, our Coast Guard registration number, uh, all the frequencies, all of that, those are on sticky uh, labels uh, right above our, right next to the radio. Well, that's a really good idea. I put it in plastic and then I, you know, put it up on somewhere. But having it near, you know, very visibly is a good idea. And the fact that we put it on the labels because um, because things change so often, whether it be the, the channel or the time or something like that, we just peel it off and print a new one with the correct information and stick it right on there. And it, it's 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 just easy access to it. And so I don't have to like pull things out and scratch off and whatever. It's, it's always and, neat and, and clean. And the labels don't harm your teeth. So don't worry about sticking it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like don't put a, don't put a nail through it, through the teeth and hold it up. Right. Like our previous one. Oh, here. <laughs> oh, a little bit on the air. Um, I did identificate, you know, you've got a call sign at your boat. ID yourself properly. If you're a ham, you ID with your ham on a ham frequency, your boat on a non-ham frequency. Remember the world can hear. So no, be very polite, speak slowly and clearly in short sentences. I'm sure we've all heard the U.S. Coast Guard Coastie oh. who blathers on about something you can't catch what they said. Speak slowly, clearly, short sentences, practice. Set up a radio log and always press the tune button. And then I put down the safety alert frequencies. Um, The U.S. has removed one of the frequencies used in Europe, maybe another one. But just be aware that there are emergency frequencies in your SSB radio that you can call for help. I've never had to do that. But, you know, the frequencies are there to use. Have any of you had any issues or tried to use any of those frequencies, Tricia? Uh, no, not, we've not had any issues using the frequencies, but, um, we have absolutely used our SSB for urgent, I won't say emergency needs, but we have used it for urgent situations before, and it has been an absolute lifesaver for us. So, and when I hear people saying that, oh, well, we had, we bought this boat, it had an SSB, but you know, we, we just, we don't use that thing. So we got rid of it. It just, it kills me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, especially because you know those radios are like i think i could drop mine i think i have and they're still good um and the radio this past fall we had a boat that was helping another boat not i say we it was just cruisers and a cruiser got into trouble offshore going to antigua and another boat went to help them and sheared their rudder stock almost at the water line which is really bad offshore when it's not supported and she used her single sideband radio talking to Dick Giddings on the Doodah net to stay in touch, which is how everybody else found out what was going on. And we could watch what she was going on the tracking map because everybody was listening. I mean, we're a tremendous little network of people on the single sideband radios. Tune button, bottom of the screen, you'll see those little doodahs going across. You don't have any of those little doodahs going across, those little dashes and dits and dots. Something's not working on your radio. 
do voice radio checks. And I threw in a couple frequencies, mm -hmm. 8104, 8152, ham and waterway net. It will be marked on your frequency list as ham or waterway. By the way, if you're in trouble, no matter if you're a ham or not, any of the frequencies are usable. So just be aware, if you're in trouble, people aren't gonna kick you off and the FCC police aren't gonna come get you. If you're in trouble, you can use a frequency and ask for help. Be sure to check your time. One of the biggest deals is people say nobody answers them. Well, if there's nobody else at the other end of the line, it's not working. And we go across time changes. So big issue, time changes, net may be a different time. You miss the broadcast or it changed. Can't hear, it's noisy. Interference, could be, could be counterpoise. But at least turn off electronics to find out your noise interference and it'll be pretty obvious pretty quickly. And get current frequency lists. And any comments on that? This com these comments. <laughs> yeah, we have had our our uh, the so our buddy boat chat that we have at uh, eight thirty p.m. Eastern time. We're all in different time zones, so that is extremely important. Making sure that you check and make sure you know what time zone you're talking about whenever you're trying to talk to people. Yeah, you can use UTC time, but people get confused about that. That's the universal <laughs> time that goes in Greenwich um, time and then, you know, 24 hours in a day and you might be on 1300 and someone's on 1500, but it means three hours difference. Um, but just figure out where you're at and what your time is. And the worst time of the year is when they have daylight savings, spring back, spring forward, and you're now suddenly on Atlantic time or no, you're not. And it can be very. And, and not all the daylight saving times happen at the same time in, right. in some countries that they may, they may change their clocks back or forward, you know, two weeks before you do. So, yeah. Yeah. Time is everything. Problem is underway. If you're moving and your engine's on and you can't hear stuff, it's probably some sort of interference could be pumps and whatnot. Try it transmitting when you aren't running the engine. Make sure your battery is plussed up because they do take battery power. Um, inverters can cause a lot of noise. So maybe turn off your um, um, refrigerator and your inverter because both of those are pretty noisy. I had one boat had a terrible time with interference until I realized he, someone professional had installed his pod. I mean, that's the heart of the radio, right on top of his 24 hour day running 12 volt refrigerator. So every time that when the refrigerator is running, he couldn't get things to work. So the only fix, because he was offshore, was to make him turn off his refrigerator so he could talk. That was the only device he had to talk on. So it was critical to get it fixed. Mm -hmm. Schedule, propagation, your battery strength, transmission length, where you're going to. Um, SSB radios are good. Propagation, I'm going to talk really quick. Okay, interference, um, I use sail mail or air mail because they have this really nice propagation chart. And I can kind of figure out if I'm at Rock Hill or I'm trying to get to Rock Hill, if I've got green or red, red is bad, green is good for transmitting um, because propagation, you're going um, curve the earth and you're propagating based on what you can bounce, basically. Um, it's not line of sight. So you really need to know what your propagation is. And they've got all kinds of, of calculations, but get a tool so you figure out what's the best time for you to use, usually in the morning in some places and evenings in others. Um, but you can see interference, solar activity has a lot to do with it. Did you know we had six solar flares today? Yeah, me. And there you can have variations in propagation. Um, there's some online free, some bundles, some for charge. Uh, make a copy. And if people are really interested, they can uh, email us and uh, at um, cruisingstations at ssca.org. And we would give you some of the information from our slides. Um, is anyone interested in VHF Radio DSC near shore? Or have we we've gotten to 811? You know what? Unless somebody has a heart attack, I'm going to say, you know, we've got VHF radios follow the same rules with connections and antennas and everything else for that radio. Make sure that you set up your DSC correctly. Know how to send an, 
um, an alarm from DSC and know how to turn it off and know how to test it. And we'll do something on VHF radios and EPIRBs and AIS systems. And again, on that data hub, if I can get my hands on it. Hint, hint, Lewis. <laughs> Maybe Trixie wants to try it too. I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could be testers. Um, but if that's all right with everyone, um, see people dropping off. Uh, I'm going to stop the share. And I want to thank you all for, for attending this. And we will, oh, if the boat didn't have SSD gear and the donor didn't have an, an, any experience with a license, would you? Uh, so that was, that was, that was, that was, yes. that was play into what I, my parting shot. Um, Thank know. you, it, Doug, for, ask, ask, for asking this question yeah. because we've been dying to answer it. <laughs> Our opinion, Trixie's opinion, and my opinion is yes. 100%. Uh, the, the, the parting shot that I was going to make about SSB is when you're 500 miles offshore there and getting the snot kicked out of you by the winds or the sea state or whatever, there's something to be said for being able to dial into a net and hear a friendly voice and give your position report and actually talk to a human being instead of just sending a text or saying it, sending an email. We can send emails, we do. Uh, and we do it several times a day. But having those voices on the other end is it, it's crew morale, huge crew morale. Um, but it in the end, it's your personal choice whether you wanna add the gear or not. Um, uh, you know, the new school, and we're not, and it's funny, we're, we're not the old school either. Uh, we're just fans of the radio. Uh, the new school thought is, you no, know, it's a waste of money. It's antiquated. It, you know, it's anachronistic, right? Um, could be, it's your opinion. Uh, when oh, you put it in. I would recommend that you do. Find, find used gear. You don't have to get new gear. Uh, used gear comes up on cruiser's form. It comes up on eBay. Uh, hunt out, wait for good deals, and you can get. It. So, that's that's my parting shot. And I'll tag on to that from personal experience. During COVID, when the whole world was basically shut down, we were in the Gementos, which is completely uninhabited. There's no cell service. There's no internet service. We had the SSB radio, and we tuned in every morning at 8 15 and every evening at 5 p.m to find out what in the world was going on and to actually talk to another person and not just receive a text of 120 characters or less of what is, was going on i mean it was like the apocalypse was happening and nobody we were we had no clue it was what we were doing or how long we were going to have to be there and then we were able to use that same net to get us to to make sure that we have, were able to get to shore because are we going to be allowed to get into this country? We have nowhere to go. And you have somebody that in real time is telling you, yes, you're good. You're cleared. We've already talked to them You go in. Yeah. And the price is certainly right. So they, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, again, I use, I have a single side fan. I have everything else too. And maybe I spent money on it, but I sail with my two kids by three dogs. I've gone across the Atlantic with them. I've come back across the Atlantic. I've gone up and down the Caribbean to Venezuela and north again and sailed in the Pacific. Um, I want everything I can have. And Lewis has been so kind. He's, um, I'm gonna ask him about the data hub because I know that there's some questions that one person that <laughs> Trixie, you know, would like some questions on. But also I will send an invite to everyone on a follow up to this because they would like to yes. ask some more questions. And we are. Yeah, there. I see. I see Chase yeah. Morgan is saying that he has right. a series of questions by all means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would and love Lewis, to follow up with anybody who would like to talk yeah. about it. And Lewis, would you like to share something with <clears throat> Trixie's spouse on the data hub or suggestions or thoughts? Um, well, I mean, I um, wow, there's so much to say about the data hub. <laughs> is there a specific question or um, no, not yeah. really uh, I, I was looking at it the the thing is is they came out with it right after 
I created the same thing network wise on my boat. So it okay. kind of made kind of made me cringe. So uh, the one thing I'm looking forward to uh, is the ability to create our pool. Uh, to, create, to create what? Create our boat pools. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. To create, to create what? To create what? Uh, boat polars. Oh, boat polars. Yeah, sure. Our polar diagrams. Uh, that functionality to me is worth, uh, I don't know, it was two ninety nine. dollars I don't know, I don't know if it went to the regular price now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's two ninety nine. yes. Now that... Yeah, it, just mm -hmm. that there is worth the two ninety nine dollars for me. Right. So there's, I mean, there's there's a couple things. I mean, there there's an SD card on the unit and the unit is connected to your boat's instrumentation. So, um, for example, you can have it, uh, remember we were talking about automatically keeping position reports while you're traveling so that if something goes wrong, you can have those. Well, of course, you would have to have electricity to run your power, your, power your, your hub, but it can basically make a checkpoint and keep track of your positions and the data, you know, wind data, wind speed, whatever, along your route. And so that if you ever have to recreate something by hand, you can do that. Now, as far as the polars go, um, what you do is it, is it captures the N2K data stream from your from your vessel. So it has everything, all your instrumentation is logged. And that log gets uploaded to Predict Wind. And Predict Wind has a, has a machine learning or an AI that basically analyzes that data and then um, computes performance uh, factors for your vessel for that particular voyage and then augments the polars that you have based on that particular data. And so because they're using machine learning to augment the polars, the more data you feed it, the better the model and the better, the more accurate or the, the closer the polars that it creates represent the overall performance of your particular vessel. And so the idea is for you to log all your trips and upload all that data to the AI at Predict Wind so that it can digest it and learn your boat and then compute optimum polars for the setup that you've got. Um, you know, the, so the, the, there's a lot, a lot of factors that affect the performance of your boat, uh, sail conditions, um, you know, loading factors, how much weight you've got, tankage, um, wave and wind conditions, uh, et cetera. And so all of that gets taken into consideration by the AI to customize the polars for you so that when you use a predict ruined routing software to create routes for you, those routes accurately represent the performance values for your particular vessel. And so that's a ongoing thing that, that, that is being developed as we speak. That is not available yet. It won't be available until later this summer. But um, that'll the, be fantastic. Yeah, the units will collect the data, and actually, Predict Wind is looking for people to feed them data. So uh, we've got several boats out there that are collecting data and feeding them to Predict Wind. So oh. we've got any volunteers out there. Um, Predict Wind can certainly use use that while they <laughs> develop these models. Oh, that's a great offer. I think I can see one hand waving. I I can't see the other hand waving, but I'm sure both hands and both feet are waving. Um, <laughs> A, um, so, okay, Janice Wheeler had a question. We had a weather router. We communicated with him each day. It was wonderful. There was a hurricane coming. We could not see on the small grid files. Yep, because you can only download certain sizes. So he could position us correctly, which worked out great. Now in the med, we haven't found nets over here yet. So haven't been using for a couple of years, but hopefully we'll get back to it this year. You know, there's nets. There's nets in the med. Let me check with our, our host in um, England, uh, Dara Blackwell, and see, I'm almost positive. Um, oh, Trixie would like to answer this live no, too. No, sorry, I was, I clicked <laughs> the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, hey, you I don't know, it. I don't know about weather over there. <laughs> yeah, um, there are some uh, frequency lists and stuff in Europe that, we, that I used over there. Um, I do know that Yachtscom has, um, does single sideband quite a bit of work over there with single sideband. There's quite a few people in Europe that are still using single sideband more than say some in the U S because they never throw anything away, um, which is good. So anyway, thank you guys very much for being here. I will send out an invite list. We can continue on with questions and whatnot. And Trixie, you are more than welcome to join us to talk over single sideband and the questions that Chase and others have, if they do. Absolutely. Sure. And I'll make it sometime maybe, in a month. Um, where are you going to be in a month? 
That is a great question. Uh, let's see, in a month, I imagine we'll be somewhere between Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands-ish. Are you heading right. south? Are you heading south? We're heading south. Okay. Going to Antigua? Uh, right now, we're looking at either Grenada or Cariacou. Grenada has good internet. Mm -hmm. Cariacou, but Grenada. <laughs> okay, we'll work on your schedule and um, see what we can do for you, okay? Sure. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Any more questions? I don't see any more. I see seven people hanging in there. Um, Trixie, wave. You've got a, a cheering section there. And um, <laughs> we've got quite a few people, maybe at Marina Pescaderia in, on the west side of Puerto Rico listening in, I think. But thank you guys very much. I will say good night. And thank you very much for listening to us. This will be posted on the SSCA YouTube channel as soon as I get it processed. And up. Oh,